Buongiorno, everybody, and welcome to the last episode of this semester's UMass Sports Weekly, your number one source for all things UMass Sports. Now, the semester may be ending, but the never-ending cycle of UMass Sports isn't, so we're going to do our best to break down the coverage despite knowing that vacation is just around the corner. First, we're going to talk about the men's basketball team. They took a step forward this weekend, beating Wagner, but against a Power 5 team, they took a big step back, losing to UCF. Ali Furlow and Phil Sanzo are going to come in and talk about the developments from those two games. After that, Liam Burns is going to come in talk about the men's hockey team who just came back from Belfast, Ireland to play a two-game set against number 9 Notre Dame. Now, how did the Minutemen do? Well, let's just say Notre Dame ain't no, number 9 anymore, so Liam's going to break that down for you. And then to finish off the show, Liam Rose is going to come in. We talked about the streaking women's basketball team who was 4-2 and two last week. They might not be 4-2 and two after this week, so we got a lot to break down, a lot to get to. It's going to be a good show. I say that every week, but this week I really mean it. Victor Cruz is here. It's going to be really nice. This is UMass Sports Weekly. This is UMass Sports Weekly. And welcome back to the show. Last week in the men's basketball segment, we talked about a couple of developments. First, the injury to rookie star Dijon Giroux. We have an update on that. And the uh, new establishment of Bryson, Gre Bryson Gresham as a player on the team. Those two coming on the heels of the games against Wagner and UCF this weekend. So first, I'm going to bring in Ali Furlow and Phil Sanzo before we get into anything else. Phil, I want to talk to you more specifically about the Giroux injury. What's the update on that? Well, Dejan Drew, we thought last week that Dejan Drew was going to be out four to six weeks with, uh, with a fractured right foot. Well, that's not so much the case, especially if you watch the UCF game. He was up about and he was playing. What happened was apparently his foot wasn't actually fractured. When he went for a second evaluation, it came up that he was just in severely inflamed. And now that he sat out basically a week, his inflammation is down and he can be back to playing his normal minutes for the rest of the season. So really the Minutemen kind of dodged a bullet on that one. Um, Drew is obviously a big part of this team, and to lose him in four six weeks was going to put a lot of pressure on a lot of different guys. But So having him back is definitely a good thing for them. Yeah, just another reason not to trust doctors, in my opinion. But moving on, so two games this weekend. Like I said, UMass beats Wagner 62-55. Then they play UCF. One of the several Power 5 conference teams they've played at the beginning of the season. The only other loss they have came against Ole Miss, an SEC team. They play UCF, they lose 65-62, a very close game, one on the last second shot, or last 10 second shot. So, Ali, I want to talk to you. C.J. Anderson was a bench player last year. He contributed some good minutes, scored some points, but wasn't really in the fray a lot. How did he contribute in last, uh, last week's game against uh, Wagner? So, yeah, against Wagner, this junior guard was phenomenal. If we want to take a look here at this graphic, C.J. Anderson put up 19 points, which was a career high and the highest score of both teams in the game. In addition to that, he also, he also reset career highs in made field goals with eight, 11 field goal attempts, three three-pointers, and four three-point attempts. Now, in the UFC game, Anderson did not deliver as much. He did not put up a single point. Um, but on the bright side, he did manage to put up eight assists. Uh, but hey, not every single game can be a career high for a player. Uh, Anderson did say this after the Wagner post game. Uh, he said, you can't key in on two guys. This year is very different. We have a lot of guys that get hot, and you know giving them the occasion. Come next game, you never know whose game it is. You just have to go out there and be ready. And so, although he may have been that player during the Wagner game, he, he let a couple of his other teammates take that in the UCF game. So definitely a positive this season has been for the Minutemen, the fact that they've been allowed to rely on scoring from different players. Giroux has stepped up several times. Phil's gushed about Dante Clark stepping up. And now we're going to talk about Flowers, who came up big against UCF. Now, Allie, besides Flowers coming up big, you have an even game down the stretch game is 62 62 what happens in those final seconds yeah so as you mentioned uh umass and ucf were very close this entire game uh 31 seconds left dante clark ties it up at 62 62 and then with four seconds left aj davis of ufc misses the layup but umass does not capitalize on that defense 
and UCF gets the ball back. Nick Banyard sinks a three-pointer for UCF with eight-tenths of a second left on the clock. So that put UCF up that 65 to 62, the ultimate score in the end. But in that kind of situation, Tommy, there's not really much that the UMass Minutemen can do in order to score and try and tie that game back up. Yeah, the woe, I guess, there would be on the, uh, the rebounding. But there were more woes in that game. Despite 62 points, a good showing for a college basketball game. Phil, you talked to me before the show. There were some issues that the Minutemen showed, despite the fact they were able to spread the ball around. A lot of guys got on the board. What do you think was the biggest issue in this game for the Minutemen? Well, I think it's an issue that's been lingering almost with their shooting. It's been it's been something that's going on for like the last three games now. The Minutemen are putting up a lot of shots, just a lot of them aren't going in. And that's really been what's keeping these games close. Granted, they're two and three in their last games. They beat Wagner and they beat Harvard. But UCF had definitely showed. UCF, they shot the ball 72 times, but only converted 25 of them. So that, and that 72 is 30 more shots taken than UCF. So they really put the ball up there a lot, and they did not put a lot in. Um, yeah, and they're shooting for the last three games, it's about four, they're shooting about 40%, which is about lower third right now in the NCAA. So and that's been an issue that's plagued them these last three games. The players have said, the players have acknowledged it, coaches acknowledged it, and really everyone has different types of remedies. Some of the players say they just got to keep on shooting and shooting their way through it. A guy like Ty Flowers did that. Ty Flowers had a tremendous game against UCF, hit 20 points. I think he had about four or five three-pointers. I think he was five of six with the three-point shot. So that's his best game of the season, something that he's going to have to do more so going forward, something he hasn't done as of yet. So he shot his way out of it. Hopefully someone like a guy like Luan Pipkins can shoot his way out of it. Those are two of the guys that seem to take some of the most shots. Dante just had a bad game for him. I mean, Dante Clark has shown enough in his time at UMass that he can come out of slumps like that. I don't think that's a concern. But the concern as a team as a whole is that they're putting up a lot of shots and not a lot of them are going in. So going forward, that's something they're going to have to correct. So before I let both of you go, there was a lot of hype around this team this year with all the new recruits coming in, Dante Clark going into Another year really emerging as a leader, Rashawn Holloway becoming a sophomore. What do we think we've seen so far? They've beaten the teams they've supposed to beat. Uh, they've supposed to beat. A good win against Harvard, good win against Holy Cross, both teams who made the tournament last year. Is this team a contender, go, though? Do you think they can compete in an A-10 where at least two teams have gone to the NCAA tournament in the past several years? Well, you have to look at this team. I mean, tremendous talent. There's nothing you can do to deny that. This team has a lot of talent. And they're very, very, they're a very good position for the next four years of this organization. But you could really see the youth on this team. You could see the inexperience. You could see Luan Pipkins as a freshman throwing up shots that he really shouldn't be throwing up. Shots that he should be driving to the basket or passing around that he's going for three pointers. I mean, things like that are things that are going to come in time. This year, are we going to necessarily see this team dominate the A-10, go to the NCAA tournament, make a run? Personally, I don't think so. I think that's something that's going to take time to develop. You got to remember, this team going forward, they're not losing anybody next year. Dante's going to be back. CJ Anderson's is going to be back. Rashawn Holloway, all the freshmen, obviously, are going to be sophomores. I mean, you're going to look at this team going into next year, really, as the year that they're really going to possibly take a step forward to the NCAA tournament. If you're watching UMass basketball, you have to be excited for what you're going to see. The talent is really, really good. You just got to give it time to develop. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. This team is so young that it's going to take some time, like Phil said, to develop. Now, against the team, the SEC team of Old Miss, we only lost by two points to them. But it's still, like Phil said, a team that needs to develop, get the groove going, and get and learn how to play together as a team. So I definitely think that they can be a contender, but this is going to be a year to rebuild and set that baseline of the team. Also a good point, Ali. I didn't think of all the new players playing together. It takes a while for chemistry to build, but uh, good segment from you guys. Thank you very much. Uh, remember, over the break, I'm going to be saying this throughout the show, although we will not be having shows weekly, keep up with uh, UMass Sports Weekly on social media. We'll give you more updates on basketball scores and highlights. Thanks a lot, guys. When we come right back, we're going to talk about the hockey team who was able to steal a game away from number nine, Notre Dame. Stay tuned. And welcome back. Fresh off a strong performance at the Friendship Four in Belfast, Ireland, where the Minutemen played very competitive games against number 19, UVM, uh, number 19 St. Lawrence and number 12 UVM, the Minutemen came back home and had a two-game set against no number 9 Notre Dame. Now, what did they do against Notre Dame? You'd be surprised. First game, Friday night, Minutemen won 5-4 impressively over the uh, Fighting Irish. 
After that, they lost 3 nothing, but still played a, pretty, played a pretty solid game. Now, I'm going to bring in Liam Byrne. Liam, first thing I want to talk about, the power play. It's been the Minutemen's strength, and the penalty kill has been their Achilles heel. How did the power play help and hurt them this weekend? Yeah, definitely the power play has been a big thing for the Minutemen. Uh, in these pa past two games in particular, Tommy, uh, UMass notched off three power play goals, which came, you know, five out of the, or three out of the five goals, which is, which is great. Uh, Notre Dame only with one. So looking positively, um, you know, holding off Notre Dame on a very strong team uh, offensively uh, through the power play is very good, very promising for this UMass team. Uh, the penalties, UMass only acquired two, or Notre Dame had four. And um, the penalty minutes were UMass four and Notre Dame eight. But the thing with this, uh, this penalty kill and also just the power play in general uh, is the Minutemen really had an uh, aggressive approach towards the Fighting Irish, and which they should, obviously, because this team is a top 20 in, in, uh, in the nation. So to answer your question, it, it was both the aggressiveness and how they approached the, uh, the power play, Tommy. And with game two, it was kind of a different story. In, in a way, um, no power play goals from either side. Um, UMass acquired four penalties, and Notre Dame was seven, um, because I think Notre Dame was a little upset that they lost to, to last place UMass, uh, so, and then being nationally ranked and up in the Hockey East. So they, they had a little vengeance against uh, the Minutemen uh, coming from that previous loss at the Mullen Center on that Friday night. Um, so Notre Dame was definitely more aggressive in the power play. And just in general, there were a lot of uh, scruffs and scums uh, in, in front of the net and you know, towards the corner after the whistle was blown. So uh, you could definitely you know, cut the tension with a knife between these two teams. Now, usually when you see, or not usually, but it tends to happen when you see UMass beat a ranked team, especially in hockey, the goalie puts up a phenomenal performance. You remember a couple years ago, Steve Masler is making 40-plus saves against Providence. Mm -hmm. Wasn't really the case this weekend. You saw Ryan Wishow only make 21 saves, the 23 saves the first night. Excuse me. He ended up did setting a career high the next night, but he played well this weekend. The defense seemed to play well. The team played well. They were competitive. So, with that in mind, Liam, we've highlighted the whole team now. Who would you say was your MVP of the weekend? Well, you mentioned it, Ryan Wishow. I mean, we've been talking about him these last few uh, sh few shows. The the goalie, uh, the freshman goalie, excuse me. From Green Bay, Wisconsin, he's, he's been playing great. Uh, he's got his third and fourth straight start uh, this past weekend against the Fighting Irish Notre Dame. Game one, uh, 27 saves, a .904 save percentage, and one out of the two power play goals he saved. Um, game two, even though Miniman lost, uh, marked a season high for 33 saves and a .909 save percentage. And the weekend in total, as you can see, 54 saves, and he went one and one. But I want to key on the last four games because the last two, um, the two games before Notre Dame, they were in Northern Ireland uh, playing two um, top 20 teams in, in the country in Vermont and St. Lawrence. And he played both games and put up great numbers. So him continuing that to this past weekend was definitely a good sign for this Minutemen team and Coach Carvel. And I truly believe that Coach Carvel has picked his goaltender in Ryan Wishow. So more good news besides the fact that we seem to have a goaltender, which we have been praying for for a long We're time. Hoping. We're hoping. Um, <laughs> the good news this weekend, Ray Pagosi came back from a gnarly back injury, teamed up with his uh, partner in crime, Stephen Yacobellis, mm -hmm. and him, Austin Plevy, and uh, Stephen Yacobellis combined for seven points over the weekend. Phenomenal play for the entire line. But it's important to note, my MVP for the weekend would be Stephen Yacobellis. He put up a goal and two assists. I think you have to have to attribute that to the fact that Pagosi came back. The chemistry between those two is undeniable. So yeah. good to see him back. Hopefully that moves uh, helps the team moving forward. So Liam, to wrap up, we have two games against Notre Dame. You take one away, you're able to win one. Now you're moving forward into hockey East play. This is, you know, this is Napoleon going into Russia. This is the thick stuff. So what are some of the things we can talk about going forward? both positive and negative for this team going into break. Yeah, well, you say, you know, it is, it is the thick stuff, obviously, because five out uh, five hockey East teams are nationally ranked in the top 20. So right there, you can see it's, 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 it's going to be tough. But to start off the, the Hockey East uh, coming in, you know, on, uh, on the ninth, uh, the Minutemen go to Connecticut and face UConn, where the last game we played, uh, UMass played against UConn, is definitely winnable, and UConn is... It, out of all the teams in the Hockey East, it's definitely a team you can easily beat. 
Um, at, at least we hope so. Um, so look, going forward in hockey, you know, something just needs to happen for this team. Something needs to click, and maybe that's Ray Bogosi coming back because uh, you know Jakubelis has been missing his guy. I know we've we've gotten um, you know freshman contributions, which is great, but I feel like the Minutemen need to have that more veteran uh, presence in Jakubelis and Bogosi, and even with with Plevy too. I mean, Plevy's been here a couple of years, so. That, that line right there definitely needs to step up and Wishout has to keep doing what he's doing if he's in goal. And I think Carvel just really needs to have a, uh, a true, uh, you know, he really needs to believe in this team because he just got his first, uh, you know, UMass victory against a national ranked team. And, and that's good for, for, your first, uh, for your first year as a, uh, the head coach here. So hopefully the, uh, the turnaround can continue. And again, follow us over the break. We'll keep you updated on the hockey team. Thanks a lot, Liam. When we come back, we're going to finish off the show talking about the women's basketball team. Don't touch that dial. And there's our favorite audience. This weekend, the 4-2 Minute Women basketball team took on both Hartford and George Mason. Now, Liam Rose came in last week, talked about how promising this team was, and this week did not go as well. Lost to Hartford 75-56, and then lost to conference rival George Mason 66-55. So now I'm going to bring Liam in. Liam, I gave you the scores. Give us a little bit more in-depth. What happened this week? What do we need to know? Well, so as you said, UMass went to Hartford last Wednesday, riding a two-game winning streak. And the difference was a really slow first half, and that was kind of a theme this past week. UMass scored only 17 points in the first half. Second half, they came back a little stronger and clawed back, but they really couldn't match the intensity of Hartford who forced 25 turnovers. Granted, they only scored 18 points on the turnovers. It's still terrible defense for UMass. They also had a season-high five players score in double digits, so it's kind of tough to stop the opposing team when they're playing like that. Um, another big difference was three-pointers. Hartford shot 14 for 26 from three-point range, doing their best Clay Thompson impression, while UMass only went three from nine. So they were outscored 42-9 from beyond the arc. Uh, the silver linings, Maggie Mulligan, 16 points, 17 boards, season-high 12 offensive rebounds. Like we talked about last week, she's really heating up, and she's been a cog for this team. Well, you have the silver linings. I mean, for, from what you tell me, it seems like Hartford played the best game that they'll ever play ever, so no, no need to feel too down about that. But big problem this team has had is a roster, the fact that the team at one point in the season only had seven players. Liam, well, you talked about it last week, too. The starters are logging, all of them, over 20 minutes a game, some over 30. So yeah, how long do you think this team can play without um, contributions from their bench? Well, I know we talked about last week it's good for the coach to have confidence in his starters, but Maggie Mulligan has played four full games this year. Freshman Ryan Holder has sat 14 minutes all season, and third place A-10 scorer right now, Haley Lytle, who's averaging 16.9 points a game, has sat for 10 minutes all year. The bench hasn't scored a point in six games, I'm not sure how you're going to win when you're only playing seven minutes off the bench at night. Definitely going to be a struggle. We talked about with the men's basketball team, one of the big strengths is the depth. And with the women's basketball team, I mean, when you have several players sitting for less than 20 minutes all season, you never know how that's going to turn out. So, uh, yeehaw for uh, conditioning, I guess. So, Liam, looking forward, going into the break, what should we uh, look out for for this team? So they're playing Hofstra tomorrow, who has a 4-3 and three record, very comparable to the girls at 4-4 four and four right now. Hofstra's coming off a 24-point loss nice. to Buffalo, who beat UMass earlier in the season by 14, so less of a deficit there. That looks like a good game. And then Bryant comes into UMass on Saturday, coming off a win against URI, UMass's A-10 rival, who they won't see until January, but they also have a 4-3 and three record. So these are two beatable teams, and hopefully they can break the two-game slide. Well, there you have it. That's the update on the women's basketball team. Thanks a lot, Liam. Unfortunately, that's going to do it for us today and for the semester. Like I've said throughout the entire show, follow us. Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram. Wherever you can find us, follow us. We'll be able to give you updates on the uh, UMass Athletics and give you an updates on your favorite teams. Have a great rest of the semester, UMass. Good luck with finals, and peace out. Yeah.